Hi, I'm David Griffith, editor of Police Magazine. I'm here at Police Week with uh, the March 2010 Officer of the Month from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, Officer Ben Kelly of the Seattle PD. Officer Kelly, tell us about the incident that led to your being named Officer of the Month for March 2010. Well, it started, of course, at, uh, on November 29th of 2009, uh, Maurice Clemens entered the Forza Coffee Shop uh, just outside of Lakewood, Washington, and uh, killed four Lakewood officers before fleeing. Um, we were told later that day that he had made his way to Seattle. In fact, we had a confirmed sighting of him in the city of Seattle. Um, I was off on November 29th, but my reported back to duty um, on November 30th and was briefed in roll call at our, our seven o'clock at night roll call um, by our sergeant and our captain that Maurice Clemens had been identified as the suspect in the Lakewood shootings, that he was in Seattle, that he was armed with a handgun taken from one of the Lakewood officers, and uh, that he was wounded, and that he had told friends and family that he was not gonna be taken alive and he was gonna shoot it out with any cops he saw. Um, so I went out for my normal shift. Uh, there was plenty of normal police work to be done, answering calls and stuff like that. And so, you know, I didn't forget about it, of course, but it wasn't forefront of my mind. I wasn't looking for him or anything like that in particular. Um, but we had a report of three stolen vehicles in a very short period of time, um, somewhere around midnight that night, um, as it turned to December 1st. And uh, this is a little unusual simply because people normally don't realize that the car had been stolen at midnight. They usually don't realize until uh, they wake up at about five or six o'clock in the morning. So it's odd for us to get reports of stolen vehicles and the fact that we had three of them in such a short time. I was out actually looking for those stolen vehicles. Um, at about 2.45 in the morning, I'm going down uh, a side street in South Seattle um, within my district. Uh, South Kenyon Street, and I actually passed an individual that was later turned out to be Maurice Clemens. Um, he was walking down South Kenyon Street the same direction that I was driving. I didn't recognize him at the time. I didn't even see his face. He was just wearing a hooded sweatshirt with the hood up um, and just walking down the street. And all I did was note that, okay, somebody's there. Um, I continued on the way. And within a block and a half, I came across one of our stolen vehicles that was just idling alongside the north side of the street. It had its hood up, it was on, and it was unoccupied. So I positioned my uh, patrol car behind the stolen vehicle and notified radio what I had and my location. Um, as I'm getting off radio, I'm looking in my rearview mirror and this individual that I had just passed, who had been walking on the sidewalk, was now starting to leave the sidewalk and move out into the street. And at first I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure what this guy's doing. Maybe he has warrants and he's just trying to give me wide berth. He doesn't want to pass too closely to me, so maybe he's crossing over to the other side of the street. Um, so I kept on watching him, and instead of crossing over to the other side of the street, now he's just walking down the middle of the street towards my patrol vehicle. So now I'm, okay, he wants to come up and talk to me. I still have no idea why he would be approaching my vehicle. You know, it could be anywhere from, hey, I just lost my dog, have you seen it? Or possibly associated with the stolen vehicle that I'm sitting behind. So at that point, I made the decision that I'm gonna have to get out and confront this individual one way or the other, because it's obviously he's coming up to contact me. So as I uh, step out of my patrol vehicle, he's basically at the rear of my patrol vehicle now. I get out and I turn to face him, and he's still walking up on me, um, his head's still down. I don't even know who he is at this point um, until he gets to be right around my C pillar or the rear door of my patrol vehicle. And as I start bringing my hand up to kind of hand check him away from walking directly up on me, that's when he looks up for the very first time and uh, I see his face and I recognize it immediately. I mean, during roll call, we'd been, during the briefing and everything, we'd been shown numerous. Uh, photographs of him and uh, so it was instantaneous recognition it really was um, and the second that I recognized him he knew that he was 
he had been recognized because his face just gave me that oh crap look. Um, so I started going for my duty weapon uh, and issuing commands of him to show me his hands because his hands were kind of down by, the s by his side and I couldn't tell exactly what was in them but they seemed to be empty but I wasn't 100% sure so I'm issuing commands saying let me see your hands as I'm drawing my, my duty weapon. And at that point he basically takes his hands from his side and dives into his kind of waist area. I couldn't really tell if he was going for the waistband or pockets because as he's reaching there, he's starting to turn his upper body away from me. So I can't really see what his hands are going for. And he starts moving around me, kind of skirting around me or almost flanking me, really. Um, <clears throat> so I issue him commands to show you, show, let me see your hands like three times and as he's moving around me, and at that point my gun is out, and I was told that he had a gun, he was going for a gun, he not obeying my orders, he had already killed four officers, I wasn't going to wait around to find out what happened next, so I discharged my duty weapon, uh, initial volley of three rounds, um, and got no reaction from him whatsoever. I thought I missed him, literally. I mean, when I started shooting, we we're probably within seven or ten feet of each other. And all he did was take off at a dead sprint away from me at this point. And at this point, he had already passed me, so now he's like at the front of my vehicle. So he runs in between my patrol vehicle and the stolen vehicle um, and starts running to a yard that's on the north side of the street. Um, so at this point, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I missed him. Um, I just need to get as many rounds down range as I can get before he makes it to that yard, because if he makes it to the yard, uh, the, the yard is bordered on the street by large hedges. And basically, if he made it to that hedge, I was gonna lose sight of him, and you know, who knows what's gonna happen from there. So I fired another four rounds as he was running towards that yard and he actually made it into the yard behind the hedge and he was gone. I didn't know where he was. Um, at that point I tried to get out over radio to let everybody know what had just happened. My portable radio failed to transmit. Um, I tried a second time, again, the radio failed to transmit. Um, I'm trying at this point just to cover down on where Clemens had last run to on the yard and the yard was next to an alley too, so I was kind of worried that maybe he could pop back at the alley. So I'm just trying to cover down every place that I could possibly uh, think that he could reemerge or any kind of avenues of approach that he may have uh, to re-engage me. So I, I never left the patrol car door um, during the entire time as he just kind of moved around me. So I'm still standing in the door. My portable radio had failed twice now, so I decided I was gonna lean into my patrol vehicle and use the car radio, uh, because that's usually more reliable than the portable radios. So I lean in, use the car radio, and that again fails to transmit. I figure, well, I'm inside my patrol vehicle already, so I might as well pop out the shotgun in case he comes back, and maybe I'll have a little bit more success with the shotgun. Um, so I pull out the shotgun and throw that across the roof of the vehicle um, and was, again, just covering down any likely avenues of approach that he, he may have to re-engage me. Um, and I was actually able to successfully transmit now on the fourth attempt on my portable radio um, and let everybody know what had just happened. Uh, you know, I notified that I had shots fired, the suspect from the Lakewood homicides had just approached my vehicle and run off. I started giving a direction of travel and everything like that. Um, and I could hear the radio chatter and uh, the sirens in the distance. So I knew people were coming and I knew that I was gonna have a lot of a units, a lot of units very quickly to my location. So I'm just basically trying to hold the fort down um, until units arrive. Um, I'm trying to again, just cover down any place that he might pop back up. Um, and when my attention is drawn back to the hedge that he had run behind, and at that point, I look over there and I can see his head poking around the hedge. Um, he's down on the ground. I can't see his body, but his head's just kind of down on the ground looking at me. And I could tell that he, he had been hit at that point. Um, he was having difficulty breathing. He was kind of 
almost going into a death rattle right there. So basically, I just held, I held on him until units started to arrive. So you know, I'm just covering down on him, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and he's not doing anything. I don't even issue any commands because he doesn't even seem like he's in any kind of condition to comply with commands, if I, even if he wanted to. Um, so I just held on him until uh, enough units arrived on scene, and then we formed a contact team, and uh, we approached him and put him into handcuffs and took him into custody. What made you uh, run the license plate on that car to determine if it was stolen? Actually, I hadn't even run the license plate. I just It had just been reported stolen within the last hour, and I was specifically looking for that vehicle or the two others, and I already had the license plates and make models in my head. Um, and when I first approached the vehicle, I actually passed it slightly before I realized, okay, that's one of our stolen vehicles. So as I, since I had passed it, I was kind of... I had to back my patrol vehicle back up into position behind the stolen vehicle, and it was that point that I could kind of look in as I was side by side with it and see that it was unoccupied. So you're checking out this stolen vehicle, and this man comes walking up towards you with his head down, he's in a hoodie, you can't really see who he is at that moment. But this is the most wanted man in the Northwest, maybe even the whole country at that point, and Suddenly, there you are face to face with him. What was your first thought? Uh, you know, it happened so quickly. I never really had a whole lot of time to have conscious thought. I mean, it was funny. I was reacting. I purely went right into training, um, and my body just started reacting. Um, and there was a few thoughts going through my head, and they were kind of like a couple seconds behind uh, what my body was already doing. I mean, I distinctly kind of remember remember thinking, should I shoot? And I'd already been shooting. And so, I mean, it's, it's funny how you need to take training seriously because your body just automatically goes into that mode. And if you actually have to sit and think about things, you're losing precious seconds. Well, that training issue is certainly important. I mean, you, you are there running a fairly routine thing, a stolen car, and there he is, the gunman who just killed four officers, and if you hadn't have been alert, he probably would have got the drop on you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again, you know, I was very fortunate, I was very lucky. Um, you try to maintain situational awareness, you try to maintain um, a good 360 of what's going on around you at all times. Um, and I was fortunate that I was paying attention that I was able to spot him kind of walking up behind me, that I was kind of tracking his movements. Um, even though I'm sitting behind a stolen vehicle, you know, I'm now more concerned about what's going on behind me because, you know, somebody's moving where they really shouldn't be moving. And uh, again, I, I, I consider myself very fortunate uh, that he, when he walked up on me, he didn't have the, a gun in his hand. I don't really know what his intentions were or what kind of plan he had, um, but I feel pretty confident that uh, only one of us was gonna walk away from that interaction. And was the Lake of Wood officer's gun recovered from the suspect after the, uh, after the fact? Yes, um, after the contact team went up and took him into custody, uh, a Glock 22 was recovered from the pocket of his hooded sweatshirt, um, it was verified as this, a stolen firearm from one of the Lakewood officers. And it, ha it actually took him a while to get the gun out of his pocket because it had hung up on his zipper apparently. So, I mean, I may have caught a break there as well where uh, he was trying to get the gun out but just couldn't do it as quickly as he wanted to. Hmm. Thank you very much for your time, we appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.